on August 20th, 1975, the first Viking spaceship was launched. Just two weeks later, there was a second Viking launch. Together, they began the search for Martian life. Two orbiters, two landers, headed for two different locations on the Red Planet. It was a gutsy mission. It was one of the biggest adrenaline rushes of mine or anyone's life. And the story, as it unfolded, was a classic example of scientific discovery. Nav is green for touchdown. ACS is green, 1.5 degrees per second max, 0.2 Gs. Touchdown, we have touchdown. We didn't know then what we know now, which is how tough it really is to land on Mars. 12.50. That is 35 minutes from now. The playback of pictures will start, as I understand it. Viking gave us the first view of Mars as if we were standing on the surface. It lasted over six years, but never did find conclusive evidence for life on the Red Planet. After all, that was the whole purpose of the Viking mission, was to go and land on the surface, scoop up some soil, and see whether or not this planet had developed life. Well, we're still looking for that life, but today we think it's in particular areas. It's not just anywhere on the planet. So we have to be special about where we go to look for it. You're aware, and you've even said, that there is, a, in, a, in large part, ridicule and or denial. How would you tell the layperson in that 20 seconds you'll get on TV what it is you believe did or does exist on Mars? I would say that in the examination of the images we now have, there are 67,000 of them of which we have examined several thousand uh, in close detail. Uh, we've turned up anomalies so unlikely to be products of nature and in some cases fulfilling a priori predictions and having uh, relationships and contexts that support artificiality that the conclusion that there, is, there are artificial structures on Mars is now beyond a reasonable doubt. And to the skeptic who says, I won't believe it until the government tells me, you would say? Uh, he, here are the pictures. Uh, all we're asking for is that the spacecraft uh, that is there now and the one that is on its way there now be pointed in this direction to get pictures that confirm or deny these uh, hypotheses to everyone's satisfaction.
here is rotating globe of Mars, and we're going to zoom in on the middle southern latitudes, uh, the part of Mars where we find these active slope features, and we're zooming in on the Newton Basin crater here. And what you can see are lots of gullies. The active features that we've recently discovered are on the slopes that are facing mostly to the north, to the equator. What we see are much smaller scale features than gullies. You can see an area of bedrock, a steep cliff here, and it's from that bedrock that these dark features flow out. Given the latitude and the slope aspect, in particular the temperatures, it suggests that there is a volatile involved here, and the appropriate volatile for this temperature is water. Probably salty water, because sometimes these are active when it's a little bit below the freezing point of pure water. Salt lowers the melting point. And water on Mars should be salty. We know there's lots of uh, salts on Mars. This is potentially actual water in a liquid state flowing on Mars today, not millions of years ago. And then late spring and into the summer is when these features form and fade. By late summer, early fall, they'll be completely gone and we'll see just a normal looking slope throughout the winter. Every place where we have multiple years, these features recur. They're not exactly the same. They may be more or less active one year than another, but they keep coming back. Tom, this picture we're looking at, Richard, you jump in as well, and then we've got the phones ringing off the hook here. This, these pictures of these so-called trees, explain, Thomas, what this, what, what this is. Uh, well, that's a region of Mars uh, that might be special in terms of, uh, like, hot springs or special on Earth, uh, where there are objects that look very much like trees. Uh, they're maybe a couple hundred meters across, which makes sense for a lower gravity field. They have a branch-like structure. Uh, uh, it looks The photographs look very much like trees uh, from above, and we've taken them at different seasons, and they do change with the seasons, and they cast shadows on the ground. And the original uh, explanation of uh, some kind of a crystalline structure just uh, did, didn't hold up at all. Uh, if, if these were taken on Earth, uh, we wouldn't have any doubt that they were trees. They look very much uh, that way. But since it's on Mars, there's a lot of doubt, and we won't know for sure till we get a, a spacecraft land in that area to go over and check it out. What's even more startling to me is not the, the heavy shrubbery of the trees. It, it's the small trees on the right-hand side of this picture. Those are remarkable because they're sticking right out of the ground. Yes, that's that's right. The, the whole scene is remarkable. It, it's uh, one of Arthur uh, C. Clarke's favorite pictures, uh, and uh, after he saw that particular image, there are, there are many like it, but that particular one, he said, he's now 95% convinced, convinced that there's uh, large-scale biology on Mars. We now know from the from the European mission, the Mars uh, uh, Express mission that under the thin layer of CO2, frozen carbon dioxide, at the South Pole, as well as the North Pole, there are enormous reservoirs of water. If you had a persistent life, and particularly if you had a life form that was different in, in, in a Martian way before the catastrophe, more inclined to live in extreme environments, like we have extremophiles in terms of microbes here, then you would logically find life in the one place where there's copious water still, even though it's in a frozen form, because deep down, Tom was right, there could be springs, there could be hot pockets, there could be, you know, liquid, and then it would extend, you know, roots down. It would get sunlight for a year because the poles of Mars are tilted by the same angle roughly as the Earth, so with a Martian orbit twice as long as Earth, the Martian summers in the southern hemisphere are a year long, an Earth year long, and then you'd have a year of darkness, but the plant might be acclimated with some kind of tough membrane and, you know, able to keep uh, uh, vapors inside and protect itself against a very thin atmosphere. In other words, you're looking at all the possibilities for an indigenous Martian life form, part of an ecosystem that would get NASA an absolute gold card. If scientists just plausibly, just conservatively, 
laid out the numbers and the statistics I just did and said we need to know more. Instead, you have the geologists who run JPL saying adamantly, oh, it's just geysers of CO2 and sprays of black dust and slick carbon dioxide, you know, that's, that's uh, transparent. In other words, they are completely eschewing the biological possibilities that are within absolute mainstream scientific discipline right now. And it is the most stupid political thing unless we are not supposed to think about life on Mars at any level of NASA or JPL or any other agency at all costs because if we open the door, George, to life, then we open the door to all the other things that Brookings said could do us in. Well, I, I, I know, but you know, Richard, if, if I were NASA official, I'd be jumping all over this picture. <laughs>